Welcome, everybody, for this first uh, Fabio Ranchetti lecture, um, which will be actually a very important event. And I uh, introduce, uh, first of all, Professor Travaglini uh, as director of the department. And then uh, it will be the turn of Professor Marcuzzo for the presentation, but first of all, uh, a few words by Professor Travalini. Good morning, and first of all, thank you very much uh, for all the people, for people uh, here, and I would like to thank to um, Maria Cristina Marcuzzo for accepting our uh, invitation to discuss. Uh, we did uh, Urbino PhD in Global Studies, uh, a, a topic as crucial in the um, Keynesian vision uh, and as dramatic in the present as international cooperation and uh, collective welfare. We are very happy, uh, very proud of this, uh, this meeting, of this opportunity. Uh, which uh, uh, inaugurates the initiatives uh, linked uh, to the creation in our university of a, a specific uh, uh, libra library space dedicated to Fabio uh, Ranchetti, whose private uh, collection uh, of books uh, has been donated to the University of Urbino. Um, it is uh, uh, obviously for us uh, uh, a pleasure to represent the cultural sentiment feeling uh, of a great uh, Italian uh, thinker, intellectual, such as Ranchetti, throw uh, out uh, his book collection. This is why we wish to celebrate this uh, opportunity today with a lecture uh, on topics that were very close to uh, Ranchetti's vision and which we would like to consider the first contribution to what we could name, we could label uh, Fabio Ranchetti lectures in economics and social sciences, for example, then you can evaluate this uh, suggestion. But uh, before giving the floor to, <coughs> to the speaker, to uh, Maria Cristina, let me add uh, um, something about the importance of this meeting, at least in my, in my view. The conference, or better, this lecture, uh, titled um, Individual Interest, International Cooperation and Collective Welfare, The Lessons of John Maynard Keynes, uh, sum, uh, sums up the vision of uh, uh, Maria Cristina and points, I believe, uh, to the way forward towards new uh, ideas, approaches to economic policy and uh, international politics aimed uh, at improving, at uh, uh, enhancing international common welfare. As we know, Keynes had an uh, overall uh, conflictual view uh, of the economic systems and system and continuously warned governments, policymakers, about the risk of financial and monetary uh, instability and their consequences for the real activity and unemployment. Uh, moreover, it is well uh, known that he felt the need to coordinate economic development at the international level and wanted to act to overcome uh, any imbalances, any macroeconomic imbalances, including um, the use of uh, cooperation between countries. Therefore, I think uh, it is not uh, an overstatement to say that even today we can uh, uh, build on the vision of John Maynard Keynes. Um, as it has been uh, um, repeatedly stressed, uh, pointed out, we are experiencing today a huge global crisis. Uh, both economic and uh, geopolitical um, crisis. And a key lesson uh, of the Great Depression experienced by Keynes uh, is that a global crisis requires a global response. Thus, not only politicians, uh, uh, opinionists, 
but also scholars, academics, uh, uh, academic economists, such as uh, ourselves and PhD students, should imagine and write, uh, and write a new agenda uh, to address the problem at hand, that is uh, securing peace, uh, coordinating uh, global stimuli, uh, strengthening international cooperation. This is, it seems to me, the essence of Keynes' international relevance today. In this perspective, it is often argued that John Minor Keynes should be considered only an idealistic thinker on international relations who believed that uh, it was possible to replace the conflictual international politics uh, of the past with greater harmony and peace. But, uh, in my opinion, it is not difficult to say that what he believed um, at that time, in that time, is more relevant today than ever. And that, an acceleration in this direction, is needed to solve these problems by reviving Keynes' vision and thinking. As we know, uh, Keynes uh, died uh, um, prematurely in uh, 1946, uh, uh, 76 years ago. However, many of his ideas, of his uh, uh, proposals to uh, overcome the economic crisis of the previous century uh, are still valid and even uh, if some adaptations of, this theoret of, of his theoretical model and the political implications of that model have become necessary uh, due to globalization, changes in geopolitical equilibria and disequilibria, demographic growth and technological progress, uh, which today, even more than yesterday, cause, as Keynes stressed it, poverty in abundance, in short, Keynes proposed a reformed vision of decentralized economies and international relations capable of holding together these three uh, objectives, uh, which for others are incompatible, bo both in, uh, at least in my opinion, in, in a liberal and Marxist uh, analysis, namely economic efficiency, the first one, social justice, a second, and finally, individual freedom, a triade that is difficult to compose in a broad and articulated body of theoretical and applied thought. Very difficult. And this is why we have invited today uh, Maria Cristina with Marcuzzo with us uh, to explore these uh, uh, crucial issues. We are certain that she will be able to help us uh, identifying and untying the nodes that bind uh, the horizon of international cooperation, of collective and individual well-being, in order to promote uh, altogether, as we strongly hope, peace, social justice, freedom, and uh, uh, new welfare, I would say, well-being. So thank you very much to Cristina for being here. And a special thank to Antonello Zanfei, the director of our PhD program, for the organization of this meeting. I wish you all the best, and I hope you enjoy the meeting. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, uh, thanks to Giuseppe. Uh, before leaving the floor to Maria Cristina Marcuzzo, let me just add two words on this. Um, I think uh, there are two main reasons why it is very, very important for us to start this new um, tradition of a Fabio Ranchetti lecture. Um, the first reason is that uh, Fabio Ranchetti was a, um, not only a, a very fine economic theorist and econom economist as a whole, but he was, he was very much interested in um, the history of economic thought and of philosophical thought as well. And uh, this is um, very, very important from my perspective because it's 
uh, a way of encouraging a broader uh, way of analyzing economic and social events. And the second reason is that uh, it connects very well to our PhD in Global Studies, uh, which is one of the few uh, PhD programs, unfortunately, uh, that devotes a, a course in history of economic thought. And uh, this is a way of further emphasizing the importance of this in connection also with the donation of this session, section of the library uh, uh, which recovers all the books that, uh, the, and, and volumes that he had collected during his long academic, ac academic ac career. Um, so I think it's this double importance is uh, in front of us and we have an opportunity of continuing this tradition of thought and economic uh, research. So let me give the floor directly to uh, Professor uh, Maria Cristina Marcuzzo, uh, uh, Emeritus Professor of uh, Sapienza University and uh, Acad Academia, Academia de Lincei. And um, so you have as much time as you want, of course, uh, but uh, we are going to have uh, first a presentation and then we are happy to uh, to receive questions and interventions from the, from the floor and from um, the people who are attending online, including the uh, the ones in live streaming who can write a message and we can collect them. Okay, thanks a lot and go ahead, Maria Cristina. Thank you very much. First of all, let me thank uh, um, both uh, Professor Zanfei, Professor uh, Travaglini for uh, having arranged. Uh, this occasion and uh, I, I must say I'm very grateful to the University of Urbino for the attention that is given to the uh, inheritance that Fabio Ranchetti uh, gave in the form of his books and but I am also very grateful to this doctoral program to which I'm very affectionate now It's my third time here and as, as Professor Zafei said, uh, I think it is very fortunate that this doctorate has a course in the history of economic thought. And I can say from experience that students are happy to have it. And so I hope that this will continue to be part of, of the program. Uh, before getting into the subject matter of my lecture, I would like to introduce you a little bit to Fabio Ranchetti, who he was and what he did. And um, this is a re quite a recent picture of him. He graduated uh, at the University of Milan, La Statale. And during a period that we were together, he was slightly, um, we, we, we graduated with a distance of two years. He graduated in 73, I graduated in 71. But we were both part of that uh, extraordinary um, uh, period that followed the student and worker movement of the 60s, in which we were able um, to cross boundaries that you were. We philosophers, because we both had a degree in philosopher, were able to get in touch with the economics, psychoanalysis, and all the extended fam family of Marxism and the political implications. So for us was a period of opening up and crossing the boundary between disciplines. Um, and Fabio and I, I think, share this experience. Uh, then, of course, the second important part um, of Fabio's uh, <clears throat> education was Cambridge, when he arrived as a student at Trinity College. Trinity College was, of course, the college of Zrafa, and uh, he wanted uh, I think he went there also because of Rafa, and he enrolled in the courses that led him to an MPhil in economics. His supervisor was Frank Hahn and Richard Goodwin. And these again were particularly in interesting years because they saw the, the, the great divide between those who would follow Keynes and Rafa and were heterodox economists and those uh, who were much more mainstream and in the end, as we'll know, the, the mainstream, as usual, won. 
and Cambridge became a place very much uh, similar to other places, but during that period, the influence of Keynesians and Zerafians and Heterodos was very strong, and this, of course, had an importance and an impact on Fabio uh, uh, bringing. As I said, Zrafa was a point of reference for Italian students, and I think that uh, Fabio was one of the few who managed to be very close to Zrafa. Uh, at the time, unfortunately, Zrafa was going through a for, sort, sort of illness that made him uh, not always be present. He had memory lapses. Uh, it's, it's not clear what kind of illness it was. So sometimes he was Zrafa completely uh, fully present, sometimes uh, I had difficulty to connect and so forth. I think then Fabio, with patience and very much closeness, uh, managed to, to establish a good relationship with him. And then we know to him, and because of that, the, um, in now the edition, later edition of production of commodities, by means of commodities, was edited by Fabio, who was in a privileged position uh, to be close to Zrafa. Uh, Fabio and I share a passion for archival work. Um, and this archival work, as I think I explained to my student in the course on Monday, is important because it allows the historian of economic thought to place theory in context. And I think that Fabio had a particular gift for this type of inquiry. Uh, he had this sensibility of a historian, he had the curiosity of a philosopher, he had the knowledge of an economist, and uh, both him and I, we spend a lot of time in the uh, archive. This room, this is the, where Keynes room in Keynes College, now are the site of the uh, archives where the paper by Keynes, Kahn, Calder, John Robinson, and many other Bloomsbury figure are kept. And uh, Fabio and I uh, did not work in this new uh, premises, but we work uh, in the library and we were very crampy rooms, very cold. We went there with the gear like going to mountains. It was very f cold as usually it was in Britain those days, no central heating. And now the archives are much better and if you go there to work in the archive, they are very comfortable, and, uh, but that was not at the time. Uh, when he came back to Italy, he came back, of course, having this Cambridge uh, baggage, meaning a background in discussion and so on. And um, many of us who work in, in Cambridge were continued to work when we came back to Italy. I, and uh, one example of Fabio's work is contained in a book I edited uh, with Annalisa Rosselli. It's a book about... Um, Cambridge economists through their correspondence. You know, those days there was no, obviously, uh, email, there was no internet, and exchanging mail was a typical way of communicating, especially in Britain, which the mail system was very good. You could get as three times a day uh, mail. You could uh, send a, an invitation to lunch in the morning and be able to receive an answer, say, yes, I come. So you send a mail at breakfast to say, would you come to lunch today? And you could get an answer by lunchtime. So that's because the Cambridge system had an internal mail system. So they could uh, receive mail. And so mail uh, corresponded my mail. There was no telephone. Was, was, oh, there was telephone, but was disliked by them. So we collected, we worked on 3,500 letters exchange between uh, Keynes, Kahn, John Robinson, and so on. And this is in this book. And one of, of the contribution in this book is by Fabio, and is the correspondence between Keynes and Zrafa. Uh, most of these letters were unpublished at the time. And so Fabio illustrates very well uh, uh, the characteristic of both Keynes and Zrafa and their relationship. And so for any of you who would be interested in, uh, in reading uh, Fabius' essays together with other essays. I, for instance, uh, uh, work on the correspondence between uh, Keynes and Kahn, other between Keynes and Joe Robinson, and so on. This is a book you might, might like to have a look at. Um, at. But 
And we came now to the project that, thanks to the University of, of Urbino, uh, could be um, fulfilled. He had a project. He wanted his libra library, which he inherited from his family, who has a tradition. His mother was a psychoanalyst. His father has a long tradition of philosopher, literally, and so on. He wanted to build up a proper library, access to the public, in a place where he wanted to live in the end, he wanted to live in a place close to Milan, and they had a communal project to set up a library that would be accessible. Unfortunately, he died before this project uh, could be accomplished, but I would like to read out uh, what he said about the library and why he wanted to, to be kept. My library contains a considerable section of books on economics, from the classics of economics to more specialized texts, the tools of my, my trade. But, it, but also it contains a continue to be enriched with texts of the Greek and Latin classic, books on mathematics, philosophy, geography, art, photography. A special section is dedicated to Felines. He was a cat lover. In short, literature, economic, music, cinema, photography, theater, history, philosophy, religion, are not considered, as in any library, different section, but different aspect of the same reality. And that's why I'm particularly grateful to the University of Urbino and Professor Zanfei, who was the, uh, uh, the, um, the one who made it possible to understand how a library should not be considered as just a sector of things, but given the possibility of allowing people to have a wider spectrum of, of discipline. And I think the University of, of Urbino, for its tradition, is the best play where a library could be. So uh, even if uh, Fabio did not succeed uh, in his project, thanks to the University of Urbino for the book and, the, and now the foundation in Turin, uh, his project can see the light and, and, and I think he, everybody, and I, I know that his family is very, is very grateful for this to happen. So as I mentioned, Keynes was one of the economists whom he studied and admired most. So I think it is appropriate that I decided to choose as a topic of the first Ranchetti lecture, uh, an economist uh, that uh, he admired and I study a lot. I must say this is a, uh, a work that I, I have done for many years, and uh, this lecture is uh, the outcome of, of many years of work on, on John Maynard Keynes. So um, let me uh, uh, start to introduce the topic that I have uh, chose to address, recalling three episodes, okay? One, what you see here as the two um, uh, Oslam Tureci and Ugur Sahin, I hope they pronounce correctly, they developed the anti-COVID vaccine together with uh, BioNTech and, and Pfizer. And when they were interviewed uh, after a couple of years ago, they say it, what, how imp the lesson we learn is how important international collaboration is. The second episode um, took place in May 22, when uh, 25 leaders uh, of uh, the world expressed their intention to, to sign an international treaty on pandemic and uh, reaffirming the need uh, of close and constant international collaboration uh, in a spirit of international cooperation, otherwise challenges, they say, can, this is Draghi, can be overcome by taking them together in a international cooperation. And uh, uh, the, 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 the third episode happened most of the same time in April 2022, when um, the new um, Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, by the way, a Keynesian academy, uh, academics, she before becoming uh, president of the Federal Reserve uh, and now uh, Treasury Secretary, she was a professor of economics with Keynesian orientation. Um, and, uh, and she said, we need uh, international cooperation 
against rampant fiscal competition. And, and that's because of her, as you all know, uh, the, the finance minister agreed to commit themselves to a global minimum tax rate of 15% on country by country basis. So I take these three episodes as a, a sign, as a element that signal a change in the climate of opinion. That uh, international competition, globalization, unregulated globalization is no longer considered sufficient to deal with the problem of global dimension. Okay? We had lived throughout a period in which the, the, the belief that markets were self-regulated, that uh, we don't need uh, rules and regulation, but we should leave the system to be uh, as unregulated as possible. This is, seems to be no longer the, the, um, the climate of opinion, uh, especially due to the pandemia, but not necessarily only to pandemia, even the tax rate uh, on, on multinational is another example of something that, that has been changed. Um, so there is room for thinking against what uh, usually uh, uh, the economists uh, over the century have, uh, have defended, a sort of rhetoric of liberalist uh, ideas and the fact that we have to go over the spontaneous uh, order, so-called spontaneous order, um, defined by market competition, and then international uh, go cooperation between government and state is seen as something that uh, needs to be accepted and pursued. In fact, since the dawn of capitalism, economists have struggled to demonstrate that competition based on free trade increases the efficiency of producer and the benefit of confuser. I can see a list here of all the great defenders of competition from Damantiu, Anders Smith, David Ricardo, you can see Jean Baptiste, Varas, Javon, Marshall, Pigou, and so on. So they all struggle to to represent competition as the best possible model to guarantee, uh, together with free trade, to promote economic development of, of nation. It is true that uh, one might say in competition, by definition, only one is the winner. You know, if you have a race, the winner can be only one. Not everybody in the race can win. But the idea is that there are sort of trickle-down uh, mechanism by which benefits extend to the whole community, okay? And this argument, as you will know, was taken up by what is called the Washington Consensus, according to which the principle of freedom of trade, capital, and competition are valid and generalized to all country, to all the world. That's what we call, uh, that was uh, Williamson definition and there are the so-called 10 guidelines, avoidance of large deficit, redirection of public spending, tax reform, market regulating interest rate and so forth. These are the 10 com commandments of the uh, Washington Consensus. This idea is that uh, <clears throat> applies, should be applied to the world as a whole. And that's in fact what the big organizations such as IMF, World Bank, and central bankers have been, uh, have been saying, okay? This does not mean that there not have been arguments against this conclusion. And these arguments were expressed usually either by the weaker countries or by the weaker industrial sectors who have obviously said this is not going to, you know, this is going to arm us because we are the weaker in the game. And sometimes this argument, unfortunately, has been coupled by some nationalist uh, tinge uh, or protectionist, hyper-protectionist drives, but this has been the response to the fears that globalization 
and this race uh, to the bottom for individual advantages brought together. So this, this protectionist or nationalist drives has been the result of the fear that unfettered globalization has brought to this country. And then the response has always been, okay, don't worry, you know, you, you might be the weaker, but then free market, the, the, the leg, you lag behind, but then you will get advantages. Maybe, you know, you are in, in a country in which you can offer cheaper labor, you can offer conditions that would allow to attract capital to your country. So there's been a lot of rhetoric by trying to persuade that everybody was going to gain. That even those who felt themselves to be the weaker part, in fact, had the opportunity to, uh, uh, to take advantage by a globalized work. <clears throat> it is clear that conflict of interest cannot be avoided in any system. You, know, uh, you cannot ignore that there is a conflict of interest in the arena of markets. And in many occasions, this conflict of interest becomes very acute. So there is no way in which you can believe to live in a world in, in which there is no conflict of interest. And to give you an example, when there is a rift by a block of creditor and debtor countries, think of Argentina, think of Greece, um, or when countries, they, they, they say they obey to free trade rules, but in fact, they do not. Uh, they mess around with, 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 uh, with different uh, uh, tricks in order to avoid the, the free competition. Or think of problems like global warming, national resources, uh, when trade practice are a little bit tricky. So there is many examples in which this ideal work of perfect competition is not in fact what's happening in reality. And so this gives rise uh, to uh, conflict of interest. So the question is when there is this conflict of interest, what is the role of government? What is the role of international cooperation? Can it, can it be the solution? Uh, we have seen cases in which uh, there is a climate in favor of it. Things of pa Paris Treaty for Climate that was accepted and then during the Trump administration completely ignore. Now we have the, the pandemic treaty that we hope. Then, of course, there is the nuclear thing, particularly these days, seems to be particularly important that we get something done on this particular level. So there are strong reasons for cooperate, either because there are conflict of interest or because and or because the rules of the game are most of the time violated. And even if you believe in perfect competition, if you believe in free market, there are so many cases in which these are violated that uh, intervention seems to be needed. So let's case, let, let take the case of pandemics, which is the one that we unfortunately became very familiar with. Um, argument for cooperation. And, you know, to have vaccines given to countries we cannot afford to pay. It's obviously that this, in this particular case, uh, it is obvious the ethical and moral reasons uh, that would induce us to say we need to cooperate, we need to, to make the vaccination not something ruled simply by the economic uh, reasoning. But at the same time, we know the big pharma, we know the problems that uh, cannot so easily overcome because there are huge interests behind it. So how can we deal in quest whenever there is such big issue? How can we deal with this problem? How can we engage in international cooperation? How can we engage in situation in which we do not leave market just free and leave competition to, to, to rule. And in this particular respect, I think that the lesson of John Maynard Keynes can be of some use, not of course to give answer to the present in terms of practical suggestion, but in terms of the way of thinking, the way in which we should be thinking this problem. Uh, this is what I think 
uh, canes can be uh, useful. Let me, let me start by giving you an example of how Keynes tackled situation, the huge conflict or situation in which he thought that the logic of cooperation should take over the logic of the pursuit of individual interest, which is the logic of competition and the logic of market. Let me start by um, a book, um, The Economic Consequence of, pay, of, of the Peace. Okay, this is a uh, book that was published in 1919, which made him very famous and rich, by the way. Uh, that's where he made his first big amount of money. He, he sold 100,000 copies, which at the time was a pretty large number. Uh, why did he write this book? He was the representative of the British government at the Versailles Treaty, where the treaty that ended the First World War, and where the conditions were set up for rep reparation, uh, the, victor, the victors, France, England, the United States, wanted Germany to repay the cost of the war and to repay the damage um, that had inflicted to the war. He resigned from the, uh, the delegation in, in protest of what he felt that these were impossible conditions, that this condition did not pursue the interest even of the victors, but would, would in the end produce terrible results. And some people believe that he was right and the uh, rise of Nazi government might have been one of the consequences of the German in feeling humiliated by this treaty. This might not be one of the reasons why the Nazi, but certainly true that Germany was um, treated in a way that Keynes thought was very dangerous for the future of Europe, okay? He wrote this book, he resigned from Versailles, went to the country house of his friend, Vanessa uh, Bell, and, 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 and set out during the summer and wrote this book. And this book, he wanted to show that the, the, the Great War has damaged the economic mechanism previous to Europe. And the idea that you could put the clock back uh, to the world before the First World War by reestablishing the same condition was extremely wrong. Uh, and the armistice that uh, was uh, concluded put a clause that was, according to Keynes, a completely mistake. They asked Germany, and Germany was asked to pay a large sum, and he said, you can set up as large a sum as you want, but you have to make sure that the country has the power to, repay, to pay that large sum. And uh, if you impoverish a country, and if you make it uh, unable to rely on its economic structure, there is no way that they, the country can pay. So it's just not a matter of justice, but just a matter of the uh, feasibility of imposing something that is not. Uh, so he, in fact, objected there was no reason that the damage inflicted and the ability to pay should coincide. And he made a calculation and said, what you're asking, is out of proportion. There's no way that if you deprive Germany of his army, of his fleet, of his industry, and so on, you may itself. So he said the peace agreement, which seemed to pursue a sense of justice, a sense of individual interest of the victor countries, he said is not neither just nor possible. Okay. And uh, what he uh, what he suggested and said was that the United States should waive the repayment of the loans. The United States had given money to France and to uh, the United Kingdom for the war. And he said the United States should waive this repayment and in, in turn, France and United Kingdom should not ask the reparation to Germany and so by 
apparently going against your self-interest. Maybe you put the Europe again on its feet. Instead, if you do, in this sort of revenge, he called Carthaginian peace. You know, in this revenge manner, you not allow the system to be revised. And he has a very beautiful sentence uh, by making this proposal. He said, here I'm interested above all, not in the justice of the treaty, neither in the requirement of criminal justice against the enemy, nor in the victory obligation of contractual justice, but in it wisdom and consequences. So what I would like to do is concentrate on these two words. What is wisdom and what are the consequences in international uh, cooperation? And I will introduce the word reasonable, okay? The word wisdom seems to a little bit uh, vague, you know? What, what does it mean to be wise? But for Keynes, he has a very precise meaning. That you should be the guiding principle that makes you depart from the individual utilitarian calculation. You know, in neoclassical economics, but economics in general, we think that the guiding be behavior should be maximizing your utility and follow that as a guide of action because that gives you the advantage. And what Keynes is saying, well, by following this principle, sometimes you do not get your interest, but in fact, you go against your own interest. So the idea that individual utilitarian calculation sometimes has only the appearance of bringing advantage, but sometimes it's pursued by everybody, goes against the interest. Um, so wisdom is a principle that attempt to reconcile opposing interests by appealing to the logic of social coexistence. Remember when we said the, uh, in class the principle of sympathy of Adam Smith, that society cannot be together if you just pursue self-interest. Uh, society needs some guiding principle that allow social coexistence. And in the case of the Treaty of Versailles, uh, Keynes thought that by insisting on the vengeance, by insisting on reparation, apparently the victor countries were getting an interest. But if the effect was the social disruption of the system, if January was put down uh, and knocked down, that would not in the end result in, in individual advantage. And so what he was saying that uh, um, instead of uh, a so-called rationality principle that we are taught in microeconomics course, uh, that if you want to optimize, optimizing individual behavior is based on the rational pursuit of your self-interest. Keynes used another concept together with wisdom, which is the concept of reasonableness, which is opposed to re rationality. What is be reasonable or reasonableness is situation in which the so-called apparently rational behavior from the point of view of uh, economic theory or call it pursue self-interest would have a disastrous result, okay? One has to to be clear that Keynes was not uh, a religious person, was not someone who was invoking, you know, to follow behavior based on some ideology or uh, that would go beyond. He, he never abandoned the idea that civilization need to be based on individual uh, freedom, sorry. Uh, so freedom was an objective, self-interest, and uh, market behavior was part of the system he wanted to, to live in. He didn't believe in socialism, he didn't believe in authoritarian state. Uh, 
He said, we are just to make sure that this individual behavior is preserved by having a social coexistence that is not disrupted by having everybody thinking only in terms of their own interest. So he, he, was, he was absolutely in favor of individual freedom. And I would like uh, to read out to you a piece in which this is made very clear in the general theory. Individualism, if it can be purged of its defects and abuses, constitutes the best safeguard of personal freedom in the sense that, compared to any other system, it widens enormously the field of personal choice. So you see this is the language, market language, okay? It's not, uh, not. It is also the best safeguard of that variety of way of life which emerge precisely from the vast field of personal choice and whose loss is the most serious consequences of an homogeneous or totalitarian state. So he said, I want individual, individualism. I want freedom. I want possibility of people making choice. I'm not saying it. But in order this for, be, for this to be possible, I have to make sure that the social texture of society is not disrupted. When the, the excesses of the pursuit of individual interest uh, are um, damaging that social structure. Okay? So there's no way in which uh, Keynes uh, can be thought of as some utopian uh, socialist or religious figure. He, was, he wanted to defend individual and choices, but he felt that in order to defend individual and choice, you had to have a setup that doesn't allow the excessive coming from that pursuit of interest. Um, so, uh, similarly, what he had said for the First World War, the ally were not rational, were not reasonable. They might have been rational. They think they were pursuing their interest. It's their own right. They have won the war. The Germany has, this, has made enormous damage. They seem rational that they ask compensation. No, they, they seem rational that they uh, yeah. wanted to be compensated. From an economic point of view, it seemed to make sense. You know, you make damage, now you repay. And in case this is folly, because you don't see the consequences of, the, of this argument. You don't, see, you don't follow up the consequences. What would happen to Europe with Germany humiliated, with no productive structure? Think what happens with Greek during the crisis. Same thing, you know, when Germany wanted to insist that, uh, you know, you have to, do, to... People who made mistake, you know, because Greece made mistake in presenting false uh, accounts of the deficit and so forth. So the idea is that you have to make sure that uh, you're not inflicting something that in the end goes against you, okay? So the, the so-called rationality principle as a, 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 as, a, as a limited application and being reasonable means being aware of the consequences of the pursuit of so-called rational uh, behavior. Second example, at the end of the Second World War. Keynes was again head of the delegation that had a very difficult, very difficult situation of trying to convince the United States of not having the repayment of the money that the United States has given to the UK to win the war. As you all know, had not the American provide money possibly um, the war would have not been won. And in the name of justice and wisdom, again, Keynes asked the United States to write off the debt incurred by Britain. And he said, it was, it was thought that Keynes was just there to defend in the British interest that he was defending the British Empire, that he was, did, did not like the idea that the Americans were becoming, which in the end, they become the ruler of the world. I don't think that this is a, a, a good interpretation uh, uh, of, um, 
of what Keynes wanted to do. And uh, let me give you, um, uh, sorry, let me give you an explanation for that. When he had to go there to negotiate, and then he didn't get what he, he wanted because, of course, the United States did not accept not to uh, ask back the money uh, that they have lent to, to the UK. Uh, he prepared a memorandum. He wrote a memorandum in 1945 in which he presents three scenarios. Okay? Three scenarios, and uh, he went... In, he presented to his own parliament this scenario, and he said, look what would happen in the three situations. And he called them this three scenario, hunger, temptation, and justice, okay? What is hunger? It's a scenario in which the United Kingdom decide to be financially independent of the United States, embark the uh, path of autarky, and continue with rationing and controls. As a matter of fact, until 52, 53, sugar was still rationed in, in England. Eh? So the, the consequences that Keynes was envisaging were not too far from what really happened. If you want to be financially independent from the United States, then you have to accept the path of autarky, of rationing, of control, of being a, a rather empowered impoverished country, okay? Second, temptation, temptation. Temptation is ask money again to the United States. And um, in exchange to renounce to the imperial preferences, mainly to renounce to the particular relationship that the uh, United Kingdom had with the colonies, and this is a temptation, you know, get money in exchange of giving up the power that he had over. And the third is what he called the only reasonable, his word, uh, alternative justice. Um, what was justice? As a, an act of justice, um, the United Nations were to uh, give, a, in a form of gift, money to the United Kingdom in order to allow Britain to build their productive system and they allow the economy, the European economy, to um, rebirth again. Of course, the Americans uh, refused, but then they changed their mind and the Marshall Plan was introduced after war because the United States realized that without uh, any U.S. money, Europe would never have been. Uh, uh. So um, this gift principle that didn't work, it worked afterwards because the Marshall Plan was in fact not a gift but something very similar uh, uh, to what Keynes envisioned. What is this gift principle? Again, seems to be uh, something very against the common sense of economics. No, in economics you don't do gifts, you do uh, commercial transactions. And this gift principle is very similar, uh, very similar to the argument he presented uh, at Versailles. Uh, because what, what, uh, what Keynes was saying is that uh, if the UK UK debt payment had been negotiated on a purely commercial basis, as the American pretended they wanted and then they succeeded, then there would be a squeeze in domestic demand and this would have created deflation. And this is exactly the same argument that it was used uh, during, um, and these consequences were only partly avoided because of the Marshall Plan uh, for the construction and this is, uh, I think, uh, a very interesting sentence in which he said, it is only through a more comprehensive agreement which attempts to offer everyone what is reasonable, again, and as far as we can, fear that the financial consequences of the war can be liquidated. 
So if we won't liquidate the financial aspect of the war, we do not have to base the um, uh, negotiation on the so-called rationality, economic rationality principle, but we have to base on what is reasonable, and reasonable means that you have to allow yeah, a different type uh, of, um, of negotiation. So once again, Keynes makes an appeal for respect or for the truth of fact, invoking awareness of the consequences. He tried to be persuaded and he said to politician, you are not seeing the consequences of your action. The pursuit of self-interest uh, is not guarantee the kind of outcome that you would. And as in the case of the First World War, Keynes used very strong words. He never liked the Americans. Um, he said once, they want to be director of orchestra, but they don't know the tune. He, he was very, very critical. Um, and there is one sentence I would like to read out to you, when he said, if the Americans do not understand that it is in their interest not to destroy Europe, they would lose the opportunity to be magnanimous in exchange for a totally unnecessary and perhaps even harmful financial benefit. And this is the, something you would enjoy listening to. This result would have the approval only of those who believe that the duty to God and to humanity is that all human action should be in the nature of a business relationship. So, I mean, Keynes said, you think that you're, um, because the, the business approach to reality is the one who's rewarding. You are strongly mistaken on that because sometimes this business approach would leave you in the wrong direction. <clears throat> so, Keynes systematically employed the term reasonable often contrasting with the reasons of the winners or the creditors, to connote a guide to action not characterized by the utilitarian calculation. That is, he said, only apparently in the individual interest. What is reasonable action? It's guided by an assessment that takes account of the changing circumstances, takes into account a spectrum of facts that goes beyond the short-sightedness of the individual self-interest. And in fact, if you think of history, the principle of economic rationality sometimes authorizes the demand of creditors for debt repayment, impose sacrifice, ignore the needs of the weakest, invoke strict rules, things what uh, austerity in Europe have done, things what has happened with uh, uh, various uh, international crises in which um, the, the, the rules, the austerity rules have been applied. <coughs> Keynes, on the contrary, invites the exercise of imagination, search for solutions that have a general rather than individual point of view. So, in conclusion, what is the lesson we can draw from Keynes? Is that the conception of economics as an extension of possibilities, not a game of alternative choice within given constraint, a conception that is based only on a vision of zero-sum games, and the idea that only by pursuing self-interest we can gain uh, prosperity and social harmony. On the contrary, we need cooperation. We need to think in global terms rather than individual care. And we have two, at least two concrete examples in which Keynes uh, made the proposal to set up institutions that could do the job. And this uh, two examples were one, the creation of a buffer stock scheme in 1938, and in 1934, with the currency union proposal. In both cases, it was defeated. 
because the logic of the interest of the people involved was too strong and um, it didn't succeed. So let me give you an example of these two proposals that um, uh, Keynes used. Um, as nowadays is happening, during the interwar uh, period, uh, the uh, price variability of commodities was very high. Uh, commodities have this characteristic of being volatile more than other assets because of the high storage cost. And uh, so private stock do not adjust as rapidly uh, to demand as it would. And so Case proposed to set up a in, in system by which you could uh, supply, have a buffer that would allow to keep uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, commodities to stay within a corridor of prices, okay? So through the intervention of buying and selling chosen commodities, you could reduce volatility. Uh, and the idea is that you do not interfere with the long-term market forces because again, Keynes believe in, in market mechanism, but you could uh, uh, reduce the, the short-term volatility by having institution that could, in particularly difficult times, like there was in 38, and like we have now, that we have the same problem with, with commodity, to have a buffer cost team. Of course, the producer and the consumers of this commodity had opposite interest, and the thing was not uh, accepted. Uh, he called this, uh, the, the, he worked very hard on this proposal, he called the commod, it was discussed and so on, but then it was dropped. Uh, the other example in which he tried to find up uh, uh, another um, uh, solution, in uh, 1940 he was commissioned by the British government to prepare a plan for international monetary order, and he came up with a proposal of international clearing union to propose free trade and harmonization of individual interests. The interesting um, thing of this uh, clearing union uh, was that um, this was an international bank, basically was to credit each country with a sum proportional to their volume of international trade, and this sum would be expressed in Bancor, which is a pure unit account, a word distinct uh, from the national currency, uh, and uh, could, national currency could be used only for domestic, and this was only to be used. What is interested is the symmetric role that he gave to creditor and debtor countries. Countries with structural balance of payment would be allowed to devalue in an orderly fashion, uh, avoiding the unilateral move uh, that had happened in the 30, but also surplus country has something to do. Uh, and so the idea is that this is innovative in gains. It's not that they just the debtor countries have to adjust and the creditor, uh, they have the right to, to do nothing. Also, the creditor had to do something, uh, and, and this is, again, a vision which is, uh, was very much uh, uh, unlike what was thought at the time. Keynes was defeated. Here we have it uh, at Bretton Woods, um, and Harry White uh, won, and the kind of international monetary system that we have, uh, was based on the dollar, not based on Bancor, and um, Keynes was reproached for na 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 naivety. He tried to use his logic and his extraordinary um, rhetoric to persuade the American, but the interests were so much opposed, and the America didn't see any need to give up on this. So, whether it is a matter of dealing with the pandemic or seizing the opportunity presented by the current crisis. The pursuit of individual self-interest by single nation through competition and then commercial rivalry of multinational corporation. If we want to have success, we'll have to give a way to construction of rules and institutions that do not 
substitute, but oversee the private initiative and freedom of the market. So the idea is to have an institutional setup that set the rules and limitation to the work of these forces, okay? And the principle of reasonable invoked by Keynes should be, and hopefully, I hope will be the guide to pursue it. Set up institution that oversee and limit the free market working. And that's it, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Christ Maria Cristina. I think uh, you opened up many interesting fields of reflection, and uh, I, I hope there will be questions and interventions. Um, is there anybody uh, here in the room? Please. Um, you should go to the main building there. <laughs> Angela Genova. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. I'm a sociologist, and um, from my point of view, I was wondering, what do you think about wisdom and reasonable? Are still words and category that could still say something today? This is my question. Thank you. I think that uh, what basically um, the word wisdom and reasonableness are trying to import perhaps from other field like sociology, uh, some guidance to uh, suggest actions that are not so much shrink in the so-called economic behavior. Now we know that the economics have learn a little bit from psychology, now the experimental, behavioral, you know, even some fields are giving suggestions that perhaps the way in which economists uh, represent uh, action, motivation to an action, is too narrow, it doesn't give you enough sense of how people really behave, and this from the point of view of individual behavior. From the point of view of society, the idea that you just pursue your own interest and then everything would be fine at the society level, that's not might be true and that's what the sociologists may teach us and how society develop and how society move in which the, the, the principle, I'm thinking of, of, of Hirschman now, passion and interest, you know, you cannot, or sympathy in the case of Adam Smith, society can stay together as long as we introduce mechanism, or as long as there are mechanisms that go beyond the pure inter economic interest, because this is not how society works. As a matter of fact, there is a very interesting uh, work by an economist, some of you might know, Sam Bowles, who worked at Santa Fe Institute, and he did a study around the world from the uh, whale uh, uh, hunters in the Antarctic and the brokers in Wall Street, and to see when collaboration is, is, is part, is embodied in the society. And then he discovered that there are situations in which, unless you collaborate, whale hunting or other, uh, it's not just primitive society, it's, 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 if you think they work in the commons, so on. So the idea is that, we use the word wisdom and reasonable because these are the words that Keynes use. But you translate them in the language, what keeps society together? What are the forces? And so the forces means that individual behavior cannot be just the pursuit of economic interest. And even that, sometimes economic interest is not even obtained by pursuing self-interest. Please. Stefano Vizentin. Thank you very much, Maria Cristina, for your very clear uh, lecture. I'm not an economist, uh, but I think I, I, I've followed and, uh, all your, um, all, all your um, 
thought, uh, and so, but uh, just in order to, uh, maybe if it's possible, continue this discussion, I would like, I would ask you to say something more about the, if it's possible, to, about the idea of individual in Keynes' thought, because, uh, yes, this idea is a very contested uh, uh, concept during modernity, so we have a possessive individualism, we have a more relational individualism, we have a due ways criticism of ragged individualism, so we have many different uh, ideas of individual, and so it's possible to know a bit more about the uh, Keynes' idea of individual, which allows him to uh, talk about uh, reasonless instead of uh, reason and uh, to connect uh, the affective, uh, the emotional part of human with the rational and not considering them as an opposite. So, thank you. Well, um, I think that one has to keep in mind that Keynes had a precise object in mind. He was to contest the economist's way of thinking, okay? So that's what is of objective. He said, so the individual he had in mind is the individual that is given to us in the Benthamite tradition. Uh, there's not even the classical tradition, because the classical tradition, at least we have classes, we have, uh, no, there's no individual, there is classes that uh, be able. So he, you have to think that he had in mind precisely that reductionist uh, uh, concept that the economists use on the basis of Benthamite. I mean, it's the Benthamite calculus that is imported in economics. And even today, you know, when you learn, uh, look the student, they nod because they say, yes, we have to, to, to learn all this individual maximizing. Uh, maybe he's a consumer, maybe is, but is the individual as a, a choice making agent who is free, who is faced with the constraint, who is faced with a set of choices, and the only thing he has to do is to maximize in his utility subject to the constraint he has. Now, of course, recent development of economics have introduced, uh, that we have experimental economics, we have uh, game theory, we have different branches in which this story is not uh, the only story uh, in town, but I think that Keynes had in mind the Benthamite uh, figure uh, of the, 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 the rational, ma ma the, of the utilitarian tradition, even Stuart Mill in a sense, even Stuart Mill. Please identify yourself because I, I might be wrong with pronunciation of your name. Okay. You can try. No, it's okay. Uh, my name is Omar Zuheri. I'm one of the students in the PhD Global Studies program. Thank you so much, Professor. You know I enjoy your lectures. Um, it seems to me that the story you told is partly one of policy and policy making. And it also seems to me that um, in this story, the role of competition is very emphasized in in, in ideological competition, let's say, competition amongst intellectuals with different propositions and different concepts of what should happen and how thought should influence policy and policy making. Um, it is perhaps not right to say that Keynes was right or Zrafa was right or anyone on the spectrum is right, but is, we can all agree that competition amongst thought certainly helped to produce what Keynes would call reasonable and wise choices. Um, in today's world, which is I would not say mono-ideological, but more mono-ideological than in the past. You know, the, we not, might not accept that Fukuyama was right, but there is truth to what he said, for example. In this world, do you believe that there are negative implications on the process of policy making and the richness of policy, given the fact that fields like economics are, as you said, been sort of reductively been reduced to certain um, repetition of the same ideology over and over again. So my question to synthesize is, what impact on policy can we see in the reduction of economics today to a single ideology and a single methodology, if we can accept that that is really the state of economics today? Thank you. Well, I could not agree more with you that uh, uh, we would like to see the world uh, inspired by different type of economics that we saw 
But there is some good news. Unfortunately, the pandemic, I think, had forced uh, um, many institutions to change the way, they might say the same thing, the rhetoric may remain the same, but the practice is different. What the European Union has done during the pandemic um, and uh, what we have seen happening nowadays, not unfortunately with the war, but even, uh, uh, even in these tragic circumstances, I can see that uh, there is some change. Of course, we need a new generation of economists for this to happen. So I hope you will be the next generation because if you spend all your time to write papers and books on something and you get it promoted and you get tenure and even Nobel Prize on what you write, you don't change your tune. And so this is something that a famous uh, physicist said, in order to change things, you have to change generations or there must be some really uh, abruptive change. And we see that, the pandemia, the, 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 the uh, removal of austerity policy has been the result of pandemia. And uh, even the quantitative easing has been something that uh, would have been unthought of, uh, unthinkable in the 80s, you know, such a, uh, so things may happen. So one has always to distinguish between, I think I said that uh, in class, one has to distinguish what the economists say and what they do. Um, I mentioned the case that Reagan, Ronald Reagan, was perhaps the most vociferous of defender of uh, no government intervention, and perhaps he had the highest uh, increase by expenditure that in all administration. So one has to be clear what they say and what they do. Uh, and then the rhetoric, uh, the rhetoric, even politicians, sometimes when they suit, suit to them, they use the rhetoric of free market. When it does not suit to them, they use another rhetoric. So one has to distinguish between rhetoric and substance. But of course, uh, being an heterodox economist, I would welcome the new generation that would bring a different idea to the market. But there's not only bad news. The, as I said, there are a lot of people who are doing nice in heterodox work. They might not be Harvard, MIT, but uh, they might be in other places. Thanks to internet and thanks to uh, this global communication, now heterodox voices can be heard more frequently than they used in the past. If you want a job at MIT, that's not you you do, but if you, uh, you there are a lot of places around the world in which heterodox economics is accepted and, and, and praised. So it is not so gloomy as it appears. <laughs> okay, Giannelli, Nicola Giannelli, go ahead. Good morning and thank you for the lecture, but also for coming here physically, which is in this time of pandemic, it's a nice thing. Um, my question is about uh, uh, collective uh, cooperation uh, or um, how much uh, I think as um, listening to your presentation that uh, uh, the focus uh, of Keynes was not on the nature of human being if they are more competitive or cooperative maybe uh, about uh, how much is economically convenient to be cooperative or to be competitive uh, and uh, so the question is, do you think uh, somehow uh, Keynes managed to find, uh, to design a theory of when uh, cooperative uh, behavior is economically more wise? Uh, so maybe in the long run better than in the short run or so on. So do you think there is some kind of a theory of uh, when uh, cooperative behavior is more convenient economically? Thank you. I can, uh, sorry, I can, I, can, I can give you an example that perhaps uh, give you an answer. Keynes was a, a believer in, in market behavior and the fact that the economy should be ruled by markets. Never thought that, uh, uh, you know, you have to system in which markets do not have a central role. The point is that markets sometimes do not deliver and uh, there are situations, for instance, in which there are a huge unemployment. 
So Keynes said at this point, that's when we need government intervention. We need government to supply the lack of incentive that would make investment profitable for the private market. So he basically is envisages situation in which something more than market is needed. The example of employment, the example of buffer stock. He never said that we have to have a government, no, a statalization or nationalization of primary commodity. He said, let the market mechanism work in ordinary circumstances. When something goes wrong, rather than wait that the market forces establish again the, 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 their work, let's intervene with some institutional setup to make the system work better. So his theory is a theory in which individual behavior based on market individual is the rule. But you, you have to be ready to step in when the circumstances ask for it. Think of the pandemic. We could not have had this vaccine uh, had not been for international cooperation. Uh, if we had the, the, the big pharma to produce the vaccine on the basis of when it was profitable to them, I think half the population would be dead by now. So that's what the, the government felt that it was needed to do. We, and that's what the, the, the Pfizer, BioNTech, two inventors said. If we don't set up an international cooperation and we pursue just the interest of the big pharma, we won't, go, we won't get the vaccine on time. And that's what they said. We, we, we can get the vaccine on time if we set up a, a climate change. Exactly. If we don't get together and find a solution and rely on market incentive for people to go to reduce the CO2, there's no way that the market... But the, so the theory is market works, say, 80, 70, 75, 8 percent, and let them work, but be ready to step in with the institutional when market do not deliver, uh, in particular circumstances, what is this needed? That will be my answer. No? Hello, Grazia. How are you? Oh, hi, Christina. And very <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> very nice to hear, to see and then hear you. Excellent <laughs> lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, I wonder whether I can ask a question myself. Is that okay? Oh, yes. Okay, fine. Um, it's the following. I, I really enjoyed your talk. It's very, very clear. And uh, you put the point across very well. But I think the conditions, what they were at the end of the Second World War, the structural conditions and what they are now, are considerably different. And I wonder how we can take account of those differences. Two in particular um, uh, strike me. The first one is that the current economic systems everywhere are more or less dominated by the activities of multinational companies or transnational companies, however you want to call them. Um, now, this means that actually their interests are not aligned or not always aligned with those on nation, state, nation states. They, they within themselves, uh, internally to themselves, there is a lot of international cooperation, but it doesn't necessarily go in the direction that single nation state would want. So there is this kind of block. Um, after all, uh, and this means that the, it's more difficult to see the interest of the United States or Britain or France and so on, because underneath it all, there, is, there are these companies that cut across the nation states. The second point is that Compared to the situation after World, uh, the Second World War, um, the, the countries we are talking about today are internally much more conflictual and fractured. 
at the end of the Second World War, you could say that there was an interest, a single interest of the country, Italy, of the country, Britain, or US, because it, was, it had to do with reconstruction and organizing the world order. But now, I'm not sure that is the case. If you take the interests of the top 10% in terms of wealth, it's probably they are the same interest across nation state rather than the same interest with other, say, British people much poorer than, they, than themselves. So you see what I mean? I mean, I wonder yeah. how you see us taking account of those two big changes. Thank, Thank you, you, Grazia. I think you made very good points. And uh, let me answer this way. What I was trying to say with John Maynard Keynes' le lessons were not necessarily linked to the uh, defense of national interest or uh, necessarily based on the interest of or the behavior of a single nation because, as you correctly said, uh, now the world is ruled by multinationals and they have interest at the cross countries or, as you said, internally, we have such a fractured society that you might easier find alliance between sector of society across country than individual countries. But I think the principle that I would like to see enforced is the same. Again, let me go back to BioNTech and Pfizer, okay? They decide to cooperate and at one point, remember, during the vaccination, uh, there was this idea that uh, setting up a competition among these big pharma to find out who was going to get the vaccine first. And then in the end, the, the, the solution was a cooperative game rather than... Um, so sometimes cooperative games are also in the interest of those who seem to be uh, embedded in a, competi in a competition. So. I don't think that the lesson to be drawn is necessary to do with the, the point of view of a single nation. It has to point to view when the competition of interest, when globalization, when, when the, the setup of the arena uh, encourages or disencourages collaboration and cooperation. And climate change, nuclear, plants, a pandemia, are those cases in which it seems that the market solution does not exist. Uh, and, and therefore, we need some kind of institutional setup that allows cooperation to emerge if it doesn't emerge spontaneously. As for the multinational, remember what I said about Janet Yellen. I mean, it was because it was uh, somehow th there was this setup of cooperation uh, prepared by the pandemia collaboration and by the G20 and the, uh, the G7, I was myself involved as a foreign secretary of the Academia of the Lincei of all the discussion about proposing uh, the uh, tax on the multinational. Uh, you would not be surprised to know that the um, American uh, Academy of Science refused to sign the agreement to have a tax levied on the multinational uh, because the US Congress is dominated by Republican and they didn't want that. Luckily enough, the G7 then agree to have it uh, notwithstanding. But just to give you an idea that all these interests, the conflicting interests are always there, but at one point, uh, if this co cooperation does not emerge spontaneously, then, uh, luckily, if we have institutions that can enforce it, that's the way to go. And the G7 Minister of Finance was such a setup that decided in the end uh, to have a persuasion effect on, on the government. I don't know how the legislation now is going on. You know better than me on this, it is your field. But I think that we had done a great big step forward in that direction, have we not? Yes, 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 there is some progress. I agree with you, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Cristina. Yeah. Thank you, Grazia. It was nice to see you. Yes, I hope to see you in the flesh. Yeah, I hope to see you in UK or in, in Rome when you come.
Thanks. Thank you. Also, grazie Ieto uh, for for your intervention. Uh, I, I will take one more uh, intervention. Go ahead, please. I am uh, Marino Pizzolo from uh, this PhD in Global Study. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, all uh, the lesson uh, on uh, the history of economic tool. It was uh, an interesting course, and especially for uh, this seminar that regards uh, Keynes. Uh, my question, uh, very quickly, um, uh, talk about uh, uh, the point that we touch in uh, uh, the course related to uh, the thought of uh, the welfare st state um, related to Keynes. But uh, I want to know what Keynes thinks about uh, the in uh, initiative, uh, the private initiative in terms of the welfare. So what is the action in terms of the welfare of the company, and in this way, if we talk about the welfare in, uh, in terms of the welfare state, but the welfare on the liberalism way? On minimum wage? On liberalism, on uh, the initiative of the company. So the, uh, the private welfare. What came? Uh, what, well, I don't think that he said something about it. <laughs> The, the welfare provided by the individual. The company, so, yeah. I, I don't no, know. if, uh, uh, com if uh, Keynes allow this type of uh, uh, reasons or uh, reasonable or no? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I don't think there was very much uh, discussion on that matter at the time, so I, I, I would not know what Keynes would have said about this. He was much more concerned with. Uh, it was not very much concerned with welfare state as such. It was beverage much more the man who took uh, interest in this. He was interested. He thought that if you provide enough employment, then that would bring with it income. And then, of course, he, he, he wanted the, the entrepreneur to pay social security. And uh, I mean, but it was not something he was very much concentrated on. It was not the focus of his interest, uh, as far as I know. Maybe Beveridge would be the author that uh, give better thought to this matter, I would say, yeah. Okay, other questions or intervention just to conclude? Okay, I think we, we can only thank you for your very interesting and stimulating uh, intervention and presentation. I, I do also have several ideas to, to share, but I think it's not the time to do so. Uh, and I, um, I would only like to uh, conclude with a sort of doubt that, I, that your talk has raised to me. Um, Particularly when you talk about the um, example of potential cooperation that uh, John Minor Keynes was suggesting after the end of the war, uh, and he actually said uh, there might be uh, the U United States renouncing interests uh, if certain behavior were undertaken by the nations. Uh, I, I wonder whether we, we are actually talking about um, cooperation or of a sort of enlightened behavior of a authoritarian power which was exerted by the US at the, at the, at the time. Uh, given the uh, unequal, very unequal situation between the United States and the European nations. But this is just a doubt. No, I, I think that um, uh, the American edition of Keynes' biography by Skidelsky has a subtitle, A Defender of the British Empire. So the idea is that uh, Keynes was presented as someone like uh, David against the Goliath, the new power, uh, and the Americans had no inter had only an interest to crush the, the, the British and to take their... The point that Keynes was making, uh, that yes, uh, maybe you, can, uh, you will be able to take a power, but make sure that you can exercise this power to the benefit also of yourself. And the Marshall Plan is an example in which the United States realized it was not in their benefit to have a, 
a completed uh, distract uh, Europe. And it was not in the interest of Germany to have a completely destroyed Greece. Who would buy their uh, uh, washing machine and so on if Greece uh, uh, was left completely gone? This is the, the same argument, you know? Make sure that you understand what your real interest is. It's not just uh, you think that uh, is your interest, uh, you are the creditor, you are the victor, you are the one who is entitled because you are in the strong position. Then this strong position may imply that you need to do something in order to remain strong. Uh, 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 to remain strong. Uh, uh, and that's what, uh, uh, that's what uh, Keynes said about the Americans. They want to be the director orchestra, but they need to learn how to play the instruments, otherwise they... And unfortunately, this role of the American as possible, we have seen they made quite the mistakes uh, sometimes in this respect, no? And, uh, well, the British Empire was not exempt by... <laughs> it is it, it, a, a, a very difficult race, okay? <laughs> maybe the Roman Empire in the end was the best one, maybe, I don't know. Or the Mogul Empire, the same the Mogul, they've been quite good. Okay, thank you very much again to the students. Thank you, so uh, we are closing this event. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.